Hi everyone, Charlene Ortiz here. For those of you that have any type of chronic illness, I'm sure you've heard the phrase new normal before. It's definitely a very popular catchphrase now in the chronic illness community. And I think most of us uh, pretty much know what it means. It means that we're now gonna have to find a new normal way of living our life with the limitations that we have. And I wanted to talk about what a new normal really is specifically, at least what it's meant for me over the years and what I've learned and the different ways I've helped my clients find their new normal as well. Because for every person, this is going to be incredibly unique because we've all had different types of lives before we got sick. And we all have different types of illnesses and limitations now that we are sick. And I'm also gonna talk about why initially I absolutely despise that term and why it made me so angry every time someone said, told me, you have to find your new normal now and why <laughs> it infuriated me every time I heard it. Um, but my new normal started back when I was 25 years old after my first car accident. I just didn't realize at the time that I had a new normal because I was convinced that I was going to get better, get back to normal life, be able to go back to the activities that I was doing, and you know, the, the car accident wouldn't be an issue in the long term, which probably would have been the case if I didn't get into a second car accident at the age of 26 and then um, have a lot of other, you know, life challenges, emotional issues, what have you, between 26 and the age of 33 when I was technically diagnosed. Um, although I started seeing my doctor for the symptoms when I was 32 years old, although I was feeling sick and feeling the symptoms of it for several years before that. So when I initially started to hear that term, and this was certainly you know several years later after I was diagnosed with, with fibromyalgia, which was about eight years after my first car accident, I really hated that term because and first of all i was convinced that i was not going to have to find a new normal because despite the two car accidents being diagnosed with a condition that i was told was incurable i still really believed that i was going to heal and get better and this was just temporary and in, in a few months um, i should be okay especially after i found the medication that, that was going to help me and function better um so on and so on I also hated it because it had the word normal in it. And I felt like at that time, especially because it was new, I had never felt this type of pain, certainly not to this intensity. And I felt like what is normal about living this way? What is normal about this level of excruciating pain? What is normal about feeling so depressed that you wanna kill yourself? What's normal about not being able to, to sleep feeling exhausted all the time, um, not being able to get out of bed all day, even though you couldn't sleep at night, even though you were so exhausted. And I felt like, what is normal about this type of life? There is nothing normal about it. Because when you are initially starting to feel the symptoms of chronic illness, because the illness comes before the diagnosis. I think anyone who has um, suffered from any type of chronic disease uh, or illness um, would agree that the illness definitely came uh, maybe even years before the diagnosis. And so when you are initially starting to feel the symptoms of this condition where it's starting to impact the quality of your life and your ability to live a normal life, it goes way beyond the physical symptoms. So finding a new normal is not just learning how to deal with the pain. Uh, the, the illness will affect your body, how you feel physically, as well as your relationships, as well as your social life. It will affect your work life. It will affect your finances. It will affect your intimate life, your relationship with your husband or uh, your boyfriend or dating, you know, trying to meet somebody that you would like to have a relationship with. It affects every single aspect of your life. There is not a part of your life that is not impacted by your illness. So finding a new normal really goes so much more beyond just our the physical pain and just learning how to deal with that. 
And so, again, that's why it was so hard for me to accept the term new normal. And I did. I really hated that term for such a long time. And quite frankly, I just thought it was stupid because I felt like, again, you know, I, this is not going to be my life. There's no way. There's no way I'm going to live like this for the rest of my life. I'm going to go back to what I used to do. And I was just determined that that was, you know, going to become my reality again. Well, here I am 10 years later and um, 18 years or no, 17 years later from my car accident and I have not returned to the, the lifestyle that I had before I started getting really sick. And so over the years, I have had to come to terms with the fact that right now, this is my reality. This is how my life is going to be. Um, I'm still, you know, not sold on the fact that it it will be like this for the rest of my life. But if it is, I am at peace with that. And I have learned how to cope with it in a way that's helped me to be able to function and still have a good quality of life. Because before my first car accident when I was 25, I was actually training to be in a triathlon. And my life at that time was amazing. I was working full time, going to school full time. I was incredibly athletic. I was running, swimming, biking, lifting weights, training, and I really was invincible. I could do anything. And I even um, had aspired to be in the Olympics someday. And anybody that knew me back then would have said that I had a good shot. Even though I didn't, you know, when I was young, I wasn't involved in any types of sports or athletics. Um, I always had the, the skill and the talent for it. I was never really involved in athletics. I was in the color guard for a couple of years, but I was, <laughs> I was really bad. Um, I was horrible at figuring out how to twirl that stupid flag. <laughs> All my friends were in the band and stuff, so I did it because it was fun, but it definitely was not um, a natural skill for me. And I, I almost beheaded a few people with my really bad flag twirling skills. But I, I, I look back on my high school years and I felt like I should have been in track. I should have been in something, you know, that was, that was different. Um, but either way, I, I really did have a blast when I was in the color guard, even though I really sucked at it. But I had a great time. And so I, even as when I was young, I always had dreams of being in the Olympics. And um, again, I, my athletic skills um, were such that I would have had a shot if I had the appropriate training and um, coaching, you know, whatever. And so when I got into my first car accident at the age of 25, all of that just kind of went away. Again, I didn't know it yet at that time. I really thought I was going to get back to what I was doing, which I, I never did. And so, you know, as the years went by and I started to get sicker, it was really hard for me to accept the fact that I was not going to be able to live out my dreams of being an elite athlete. And even if I didn't, you know, make it to the Olympics, I still wanted to do great things in the athletic world, like, again, doing triathlons and such. And so I never got a chance to do that, you know, because um, of my injuries and my limitations. And even for a long time, I really hated it when the Olympics um, would come around. I, I hated watching it. It was actually painful for me to watch it because every time I would watch it, even though it was every four years, um, well, actually, I think every two years for the summer now, but um, even though I, I would watch it, um, I, it just, I felt devastated, you know, that that was something that I could have had a shot at and never got a chance because of something that was not even my fault because neither car accident was my fault. And one, I was a passenger and the second one, we got hit by two guys in a stolen car. And so it was very hard for me to accept that that was no longer going to be something that I would accomplish because I always felt like, oh, someday I'm going to be somebody great and accomplish something fantastic and everybody's going to know who I am and blah, blah, blah. And to kind of, you know, let go of that, that that never will be a reality for me um, was it was hard and it, it was really devastating. And so there are three things um, that have helped me over the years to accept my new normal and again, still be able to appreciate and enjoy my life despite the limitations that I have. The first one 
is retraining my thought process. I really had to get out of this negative, self-defeating mindset that I will never accomplish my, my dreams, I will never be able to do what I want to do, I will never be able to get back to the life that I had when I could work full time and I was very productive and um, I you know, felt invincible and everybody thought I was amazing, whatever, um, because of what I could physically do. Um, just letting go of that was very difficult for me to do. That that is not going to be my life, that is not going to be my future. And the life that I had before is I will not be returning to that again. And it, it really is like a death. It really is. And I think that's why for people with chronic illness, we grieve a lot when we are initially diagnosed. Or again, even before the diagnosis, when we really start to feel of the impact of the illness and we really start to see the drastic impact it's having on our quality of life we grieve because a part of us does kind of die you know the the part of us that had a certain hopes and dreams and the things that we aspire to be that dies along you know with with the, with the diagnosis and with the symptoms as well as the life we used to have it, it dies and so that's why it can feel like a grieving process when you are diagnosed and when you first start feeling the symptoms because you are grieving. You are you know, grieving a loss in a sense, a loss of what, what you thought your life was gonna be and what your life was before you got sick. And the way that you think and what you fill your mind with is going to drastically affect Affect your quality of life because the first thing is that right now this is your reality and there's really not much that you can do about it and when I say that I'm not saying you know just lay down and die and just forget about living that's not what I'm saying I'm just saying right now at this moment at this point you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and be healed it's not gonna happen certainly there are things that you can do but I'm just talking about the diagnosis, how you're feeling every day. Um, at this point, you, again, you, you're not going to magically, miraculously just be healed overnight. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. And you have to be able to accept that. Okay, this is going to be my life now. And I'm going to have to just learn how to alter my lifestyle and my relationships and uh, my activity levels you know, and you know whatever it is so that I can um, live functionally with this condition and if you are constantly thinking about how horrible your life is how much you hate your life if you're constantly thinking about the things you will never be able to do that you will never achieve um, like I saw a post a post one time on, on Facebook where someone had put a post that said it said something it was about chronic illness and and one of the things that that was in the the post that this person put was and I and I and I also sit down and write down all the things I'll never be able to do um, that is something I highly recommend against <laughs> certainly do not write down the things that you will never do in your life uh, that will accomplish nothing and there's absolutely no point to it and I'm not saying there's anybody out there watching that, that that does that but when I read that I thought to myself oh my god what a destructive post to put because that's the last thing anybody should be doing it's I mean it's already in our mind enough to actually write down I'll never be this I'll never be that is a sure way to um, leave you very depressed and hopeless and feeling desperate and hating your life and so thinking about all the things that you'll never be able to do or the things you used to be able to do that you can't do anymore and just focusing on that all the time will accomplish absolutely nothing again you will go through a grieving period and the grieving period is is completely natural it's completely normal and you kind of have to go through that grieving period because again you do suffer something of a loss you do some suffer something of a death and when there is any type of loss or death in our life we do go through a grieving period 
but at some point we do have to heal and recover I mean we, we never completely heal especially with certain you know losses in our life but you do have to move forward at some point you never forget what you lost but you have to move forward at some point in your life and your life cannot become all about grieving about what you lost and so if you don't move on at some point in your life you obviously are never going to find your new normal and, and you will never find any reason or, or, or any way to enjoy your life and to enjoy the existence that you have here so you really have to start having self-control and be conscious of your thought process so allowing thoughts into your mind like I hate my life my life sucks I wish I could die. I will never accomplish my dreams. I'll never amount to anything. I'll never be what I used to be. I'm, I'm useless now. I'm pathetic. I can't do anything. The, I mean, because these are all thoughts that have gone through my head. And these are thoughts that I used to nurture all the time, which did um, lead me, get, get me to a point where I wanted to get, commit suicide. I never acted out on it because I simply didn't have the guts. But there was a point in my life I did want to commit suicide. And I would pray every night that God would take my life in my sleep because I really did not want to live. So I definitely went through a major grieving period where these thoughts completely dominated my mind. And But again, at one point, I had to snap out of it. And I had to just slowly start to kind of regain my thoughts again. I had to regain my sanity again. And it was a process that, that took time. It certainly wasn't something that one day I just woke up and said, okay, well, all right, I'm going to figure this all out. I'm going to, you know, um, learn how to enjoy my... It didn't, it didn't happen like that. It was a very gradual process. And um, it did take time. But as time went on, you know, I was able to start having a much more productive thought process. You know, where instead I would think to myself, okay, this is my reality. This is what I have to deal with now. How can I figure out how to still have something of, produ of, a, of a productive life and not keep spiraling into this deep depression that is destructive and is robbing me of all my joy and my ability to live my life? Because um, I wasn't going to kill myself. That, that just wasn't an option. So if I'm not going to kill myself, if I don't have the guts to go through with it, then I need to figure out a way how to function and how to live with this and still enjoy my life. And so um, little by little, I was able to pull myself out of that deep depression that I was in and just start think, changing the way that I thought. Um, the second thing that helped me was to alter my goals. Of course, you know, I knew that I wasn't, going to be able, like, I likely was not going to be able to accomplish some of the things that I wanted to. Like, I wanted to go on and get my master's degree in school and go on to uh, maybe even be a doctor, you know, who knows, you know, but I knew that I, at that time, I wanted to go on and be some, some great things. Um, not that I still can't be great things, but great things as seen by society or that my mom be proud, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, those kinds of great things. Um, and I had to let that go. You know, that you know, at this point, that that is not going to be a reality and I need to let that go and I need to focus on a reality that is going to be realistic for me, a future goals that are going to be realistic for where I'm at right now. And that, again, just like changing my thought process was definitely a process for me and also letting go of the things that I used to be able to do. And finding alternatives to that, that I could do and that was possible for me. One thing I really enjoyed doing a lot before I got into my car accident was martial arts. And I was taking martial arts classes and I had even um, graduated to um, a, a couple belts up from the beginning belt. And I, I absolutely loved it. I really just enjoyed the discipline. I enjoyed just the, the physical fitness aspect of it. I enjoyed the empowerment of it. And just, you know, feeling like I'm learning a skill that if, if I ever got in trouble, I could use it to protect myself or, you know, what have you. 
Um, but more than anything, I just really enjoyed just the mental discipline that, that came with the martial arts. And that was something that I had to let go. And I had to find an alternative you know, to, to the form of martial arts that I was doing before, which was obviously much more high intensity, kicks, punches, stuff like that, that I absolutely could not do now, um, and find other alternatives that still provide the same mental discipline. Um, even physical activity might not be as intense as, you know, what I was doing before. Um, however, it does still have great physical benefits like Tai Chi or, or Qigong is, is one that's not very well known, but is incredibly beneficial form of, of martial arts. And I just start really um, practicing that and just getting a lot more engrossed into that type of martial arts. And I just find, again, I just found an alternative to something that I really enjoyed and uh, a way that I could do it now. Um, another thing that I took up after I had come to terms I wasn't going to do martial arts anymore was crochet and knitting, which um, one of my great friends, Zadra, I can thank for that. And I will forever be grateful to her for teaching me how to knit. And I was actually in my early 30s when I learned how to knit, which, you know, at, at the time I felt like was an old lady craft or, or pastime. Um, which sir, obviously it's not. You can knit at any age and enjoy it. But, you know, you always think of a grandma or somebody sitting down crocheting, making a blanket or a sweater. So that was definitely, you know, a, um, the, the, the stereotype that I had about knitting. And so um, my friend taught me how to knit. And uh, my mother-in-law taught me how to crochet. And it's actually become a pastime that I absolutely love, that I've been doing for almost 10 years now. And I love to knit. I love to crochet. It is so relaxing. And it really helps me, tremendous me with, tremendously with my anxiety. And it is a skill that you do have to learn and concentrate and get good at if you want to make different things and what have you and you want it to look nice. Um, not, I'm not very good at it <laughs> at this point. I'm good my, my blankets are kind of laughable, but Hey, you know, I made them. They're there. I'm still proud of them. And it's a, it, it's a, a, a skill that I've, I've really learned to love and enjoy more than I ever thought I would. And so had I not, um, developed this illness, I would have never learned this skill that I, I really enjoy now that brings me a tremendous amount of joy and peace and relieves my anxiety. Um, it's not doing high kicks or, you know, any Bruce Lee stuff, but it is something that does, um, again, it brings me a lot of peace of mind. And when I'm done, I have something, I have a blanket or a scarf, well, that's all I can make right now, but <laughs> I have something that I, and I've given a, a couple of blankets away to people that really, really loved it and enjoyed it. And, um, it made me very happy to give something to someone that's going to warm them in the, the cold winter nights and they'll think of me. And, um, so, you know, is something that I've been able to really appreciate and uh, was it really was a great alternative uh, to help me with my anxiety then the, uh, as opposed to the martial arts that I was doing um, before that was high intensity and again as well as things like Tai Chi, Qigong, what have you but um, so I, I just learned how to alter my goals um, as opposed to the ones that I had before I got sick Another thing that um, I started doing when I got sick, I really started to focus my training on special populations and people that had chronic illness and chronic pain. Before that, I was I, I did work with people that had injuries um, and certain you know um, chronic conditions, that neurological, what have you. But um, it wasn't to the extent that what I I work with now and that I have been since I was diagnosed and I since I started getting sick and after I was when I was able to finally go back to work, um, I decided that my training was now going to focus on a population of people that dealt with chronic pain and chronic illness, injury, you know, what have you, and it's made me a much more effective trainer than I have ever been in my life. Number one, because I can now have compassion and empathy that I never had before. Number two, because my clients trust me in a way that they would not have before. And number three, I can challenge my clients in a way that I couldn't before because they can't tell me you don't understand because I do understand. 
I do understand the pain. I do understand the discomfort. I do understand the depression and everything else that comes with it. I also understand that you still have to push yourself to get out there and to do something. You still have to, you still have to take care of yourself. You still have to be active. Obviously, it has to be appropriate so that you don't hurt yourself or initiate flare-ups. However, you still have to make a very honest effort to take care of yourself and to be healthy and to be active. And so it's given me that, that unique perspective now and that unique ability to challenge my clients because they can't say, well, you don't understand. But it, instead, they'll, they're inspired by me um, with my ability to still be active and take care of myself. And they look at me and say, you know what, if she can do it and she struggles with what I struggle with, then I can do it too. And obviously, you know, with the help and guidance and the support I was able to give them, they were able to accomplish and achieve a lot. And certainly, um, I, 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 of course, enjoy, you know, training an elite athlete that can is able to get stronger and faster. I mean, sure, it's very rewarding. It's, and it's wonderful to see someone go from a size 12 to a size 4. Those are wonderful things. Um, but working with people that have chronic illness, working with special populations, for me, has actually ended up be, being so much more rewarding than working with any other type of client. Because what these people have to overcome is so incredible. And it's so much more than so many other people could ever imagine. And although the things that they achieve might seem small to other people, for them, it is a huge accomplishment. And just for them to um, come to into a session and say, you know what, Charlene, the other day I was able to go for a beautiful walk, you know, in the woods with my husband, and we haven't done that in years. And that's because of what we've been doing in our training sessions, and I feel like, I felt like I was able to actually enjoy life again for the first time in years. That to me is so much, is so much more rewarding than getting someone from a size 12 to a size four. Again, even though that's a wonderful thing, uh, but just hearing that somebody's quality of life and their ability to do normal things again because of the workouts and because of the effort that they put in, because they would always give me credit and I would say, no, you're the one that takes the credit. I just tell you what to do. You're the one who has to do it. You're the one who has to come in here and be committed to this. They get all the credit for it. And just and some of the things that my clients would come in and tell me, just the things that they were able to achieve and accomplish because of the training, sometimes it would bring me to tears. It really was that touching and that inspiring. And had I not developed the condition that I did, um, or and the, as well as the car accidents, what have you, um, I would not be able to experience that, you know, to the level that I do now. And also, it inspired me to write a book, which I would have never, you know, thought about writing a book. And just to um, help people deal with, with their chronic illness and, and whatever disability limitations they have, um, and still be able to enjoy their life in some way. And so there are certainly um, a lot of several things that having my chronic illness has opened me up to that I would have never been able to experience before and wonderful, wonderful things that I would have never been able to experience before and wonderful people that I would have never met before and um, just the type of clients and, and that would, I would work with. And there was one client in particular, just a quick story that I worked with. And this individual had MS and, and she was specifically put with me because of my chronic illness and my limitations. So I would always get the, the special populations clients because of my limitations. Um, but she, um, she worked with me for uh, almost six years, almost the whole duration that I was at the last gym that I was at until I moved um, to here to Vegas. But she had MS. And when she was 19 years old, she was in a serious car accident that actually put her in a body cast um, all the way up, you know, to her, her um, the top of her chest. And she had to have a rod put in her arm, a rod put in her leg. And after the car accident, she experienced excruciating pain, which she continued to experience. She had um, uh, several of her, ver of her lumbar vertebrae, uh, vertebrae fused as well. And... Uh, towards the end of our training, the time period that I trained her, 
um, she also developed breast cancer and she had to go through radiation therapy. And during this time period, even when she was going through radiation, this woman showed up for her training sessions twice a week religiously. And I was so inspired by her. And so were all the other trainers. They were so inspired by this woman because she was so committed. And and there were times when our workout was very low key, where we had to do just floor exercises and stretching, but she still came in. And there was never a time that she did not feel so much better after her training session. And this is a woman, I, I will share her story until the day I die because she's such an inspiration. And I have so many other stories of amazing clients that I've worked with over the years. And um, I would like to start a series on my channel, um, just, you know, um, talking, just telling stories of amazing clients just to inspire you of people that had tremendous um, obstacles and limitations and yet accomplished, accomplished amazing things. I mean, they're not in the Olympics right now or anything like that, but, you know, they made incredible progress that they never thought was possible. So, I mean, those are definitely stories I would love to share with, with my viewers just to inspire and motivate you that even with your limitations, you can still achieve great things in life. And so she was someone that um, I had so much admiration for. And I, I um, was a, so inspired by this woman. And so again, had I not dealt with the limitations and the illness that I have to deal with, I would not have been set up with her. I would have never met her and I would have never been able to experience the time period that I had with her and just the inspiration, the motivation that I got from watching her and, and watching her progress, seeing her get stronger and improve her balance and her energy. And, um, it really just, um, it was so inspiring and it was, it was very, um, and it was also just, just very touching too, just to see how dedicated she was despite the pain that she endured. And, um, and I'll tell you, there were days she came in there, she was in a lot of pain and she still pushed through and, and she still did her workouts. I mean, there are, there are times she had to cancel because the pain really was that bad, but um, she really did try to push through if, if she could. Um, and the, the third thing that has helped me over the years um, is, as far as finding my new normal has been um, just learning how to alter my life um, for my illness and to be grateful for the little things, things that I wasn't grateful for before. And as far as what I mean by altering my life is learning how to take care of myself physically and emotionally. That really everybody should, but when you um, start to experience symptoms from a chronic illness, it forces you to learn how to take care of yourself and how to alter your life in such a way that you prioritize your health, you prioritize your well-being, you, you prioritize your, your um, rest, um, your mental and physical health. Um, you really start to become <clears throat> a lot more particular of the type of relationships that you allow in your life. Um, you really learn how to say no to people and not feel guilty about it. Um, that took a long time for me. That really took a long time for me to learn how to tell people no and not feel bad about it. Um, and it also, again, taught me to be grateful for simple things in life that I would, I never really appreciated before because I was in such a hurry. Because I had so much energy. I had the ability to do so much. I was always out doing stuff, you know, going out and about. And I didn't really take the time to appreciate small things in life. And now that, um, that I have to deal with this and I've had to drastically slow down and alter my life, I do appreciate things that I never appreciated before. You know, like time with my husband, um, even time with my animals, um, just the people in my life that have been incredibly supportive and patient with me and have been, been there with me through this whole time and have stayed um, very faith, faithful and uh, reliable friends. 
um, again, as, as well as um, not allowing people in my life that are very negative, very selfish, very draining, that um, will provide no benefit to me because I just don't have the energy or the time to deal with it because uh, my energy is, is, you know, so limited now. I really have to make sure it is spent on things that really are important in life. Now, when I have the energy to go out with friends and spend time with them, I appreciate it so much more than I ever did before because it's not something I can do as often as I used to do. And I've learned that my health and my wellness really is priority. It really is number one over everything else because if you don't care, take care of yourself, you, re you can't take care of anybody else and you can't enjoy your life. And it really does force you to have to slow down and it really does force you to have to, you know, just take a step back and just evaluate the things that you thought were important in life. And the things that really are important, you start to appreciate and you start to embrace so much more when you have to deal with a chronic illness on a regular basis. And that's one thing that I am so incredibly grateful for and has become a new normal for me that I really, really uh, appreciate and I enjoy now because um, I meditate so much more. I would definitely say I'm a much more spiritual person than I used to be. Um, interestingly enough, I'm not religious. I was very religious and a very devout Christian for 40 years, but I'm not anymore. Um, however, I'm still a very spiritual person. I do still very much believe in God and I'm um, having high morals and high ethics and stuff like that. But um, I mean, I'm not against religion or people that are religious, you know, not at all. Um, if you are religious and, and you enjoy that, you embrace it, then I think that's wonderful. Um, but for me, I just, you know, went a, went a different route um, personally. But again, I just really have become um, a person who really uh, tries to connect with people in a much different way than I used to. And, um, and I just see how I'm led to different people in my life now. Um, in a way that really does feel um, like divine intervention, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, at least to me, it, it, it feels that way, you know. I mean, it could be coincidence, but to me, it does feel like something, you know, is greater. But And so, um, yeah, it just, it, it's really helped me um, to just evaluate what's important in my life and not to stress about the things that don't really matter. And so before I end this video, real quick, I just wanted to go through a feed that I saw on Facebook um, today with a group that I'm a part of. And this, um, the owner of the group um, had put up a post saying, um, I want you guys to name one thing about your chronic illness that you're grateful for, which, you know, can sound, you know, kind of... Um, um, like an oxymoron, I guess, you know, like how could I be grateful for something with my chronic illness? But I thought it was a wonderful post. And I just wanted to go through some of the things that, that people said on here, which really to me was, was very touching. Um, sorry, my weather app came up all of a sudden. And it takes forever to go to where I want it to. Okay, here we go. Um, but anyway, you know, like I said, it really was um, very impactful, some of the stuff that people said. Okay, here's uh, what one woman said. I am grateful I no longer hide my illness. Um, it gave me precious time with my father I, I wouldn't have had before he passed away. Because, you know, she can't work as much anymore. So she was able to spend time with her sickly father, which is really something that's priceless. I get to see my little girl all day long, which is, again, something that's priceless. I am more sympathetic and empathetic. How much more time at home with my son I've been given? This one woman um, I thought was hilarious. It makes me thankful for my bed, <laughs> um, which I am very, you know, thankful for my bed many times. Another woman said, I'm grateful that although my illnesses mean that I can no longer work, that means that I have more time to spend enjoying and doing my handcrafts. It made, it's made me prioritize things in my life. I, I don't have time or energy for BS, which is a wonderful, wonderful, 
gift that our, that our illness can give us as well. My illness makes me more grateful for the good days, thankful for wonderful patient people around me, and makes me learn to prioritize myself and my needs. Because I am too sick to work and in too much pain to leave home, I get to spend lots of time with my quirky special kitties. My chronic illness got me back in church and teaching. I love it. And I'll just read a, a couple more. I learned to prioritize what's really important and say no. And last one, I'm very lucky to have four children, three girls, one boy, and my illness started when my youngest was born. He's now 16, and the next oldest is 23. My son is incredibly empathetic with everyone around him. He managed to get his girlfriend to see a doctor for her severe anxiety, depression, and other very worrying mental health issues that her parents hadn't noticed. Her mom is a, a counselor. I'm so proud of the people all my children have are have and are becoming they have been very they may have been very different if my health hadn't forced them to see what chronic illness health can do to a person and their family so I just wanted to share that with you guys before I end this video um, you know just how these women you know have been able to come to terms with their illness and um, how they again have been able to see and how it's benefited them in some ways so but anyway guys I know that especially if you are someone who's just started to experience um, the pain of chronic illness maybe you don't know what's wrong yet maybe you haven't been diagnosed maybe you're going through that whole hell <laughs> of figuring out what's wrong what medications gonna be appropriate or your doctor telling you it's all in your head or, or what have you maybe you're going through that um, part in your life right now Maybe you've had it for several years and, and you're still angry and bitter about it, which I completely understand, which is completely normal. You know, um, who knows wherever you are, you know, in, in, at this stage of your life with your chronic illness. Um, it, there is a new normal. There really is. And it can be a wonderful new normal. It really can. And it really is up to you. It's really up to you um, how you respond to it because... Often in life, we don't have control of our circumstances or the things that happen to us. We can only control how we respond to them. And so how will you respond to this illness and these limitations that you have now been played with, with this card that you've been dealt that's not a great hand? Um, how you respond to it is what will determine what your new normal will be. So your new normal can be being depressed and suicidal like I was and hating your life and not accomplishing anything. Or your new normal can become something greater than you ever thought it could be. And you could even end up doing greater things than what you thought was possible before you got sick. It really is up to you. It really is um, up to you how you are going to let this impact you and the power you're going to let this have over you. And it doesn't make the pain go away. You know, finding a new normal doesn't mean that, you know, um, that you won't deal with the depression sometimes. It doesn't mean you won't have horrible flare-ups some days where you're completely debilitated. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you learn to accept what you have and you learn how to still enjoy your life and that you can still do wonderful and great things regardless of your limitations. So, all right, guys, I really hope that that helps those of you that are really having a hard time with this right now. And my heart really does go out to each and every single one of you. Whether you are at peace with it or you're trying to come to terms with it, um, it's still a, a very disheartening, a very devastating um, situation to deal with. And my heart really does go out to you because I, I understand. <laughs> I can sit here and honestly, you know, at this point say I really do understand. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for your time and attention. As always, I really appreciate it. And again, I really hope that this did help you, um, you know, to just figure out a way that you can still enjoy your life and, and still um, live your life to the full. You, you can still live your life to the full. It's just going to be in a different way now and that, you know, you can be creative 
you know, in the, the impact that you can make in the world. And an even greater impact now so, you know, because people will see that despite your limitations and the obstacles you face, that you are still able to accomplish great things. And what a great thing is, um, does not have to be what society or whoever says great things are. It doesn't mean having a job that makes a lot of money or a perfect relationship or a perfect body, you know, <laughs> that's just, oh, that's all superficial. Those are all shallow things, you know, great things, um, in my opinion, really have nothing to do with that. So, all right, guys, remember, take care of yourself, protect yourself physically and emotionally, and don't forget your health is your most valuable asset. Invest in it. Bye-bye.